Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Patrick Mann. Today I begin our land acknowledgement, uh, recognizing the particular honor of having Shelley Nero, a member of the Six Nations Grand Reserve, River Reserve, Bay of Quinte, Mohawk Nation, Turtle Clan, as our speaker. Western University is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Luna Paywak, and Atawandran people who have long-standing relationships to the land and the region of southwestern Ontario and the City of London. The local First Nations communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. In the region, there are 11 First Nations communities and a growing indigenous urban population. Western values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the pe original peoples of Turtle Island, also known as North America. So today I'm sharing the podium, so to speak, with two of my favorite people, both of who I met in 1995 when I arrived at Western. The artist, Shelley Nero, was in her first year of our MFA program in visual arts, and Dr. Madeline Lennon was in her first year as chair of visual arts. Would any of us three have imagined ourselves in these circumstances some 23 years later? not me. But in the interest of being brief, before I say a few words about Madeline, who will be introducing Shelley today, I'll simply add that one of the great honors of my career here at Western has been to be the director of SASA, and one of the great honors of my directorship at SASA has been to have Shelley Nero teaching our fourth year seminar course this year. Now, Dr. Madeline Lennon. Madeline holds a BA in English from the College of New Rochelle in New York, an MA and a PhD from the University of Toronto, and also did ec extracurricular art history studies at the Sorbonne and Ecole de Louvre, Paris. Madeline taught and worked in leadership roles at Western between 1979 and 2008, when she became Professor Emerita. Over that period, she received the following. The Pleva Award for Excellence in Teaching, a 3M National Teaching Fellowship, and she was named a YMCA Distinguished, Distinguished Woman of the Year. Madeline's teaching at Western encompassed a broad range of art history with a focus on the Baroque period, and it also included museum studies courses and the development of an internship placement program in visual arts, which was far ahead of its time. At the same time as all that, Madeline was heavily involved in university-wide initiatives. Among these were the development of the Women's Studies Program and the review of Western's policy on sexual harassment. Among Madeline's publications, a book published in 2014 by Blue Medium Press, Shelley Nero, Seeing Through Memory, is among her most important. It's an honor to welcome Dr. Madeline Lennon and to ask her to introduce Shelley Nero, and I will do that in one minute. But I also want to remind you that as we have done before, after Shelley's talk, we will have two SASA students. I guess one is really a SASA student and one's a SASA graduate. So we have Maggie Graham and Mariam Golifshani who will be leading off the question. So I thank them in advance for their contributions. And now I turn the microphone over to Madeline Lennon. Thank you, Patrick. Shelley Nero is one of the most important artists working today in North America. As a publication of the National Gallery of Canada notes, Shelley Nero has changed how people look and think about Indigenous art and artists. In 1991, her series of photographs, Mohawks and Beehives, was exhibited at Mercer Union in Toronto, depicting her mothers and sisters with wit, irony, and compassion. Her work was hailed as an act of liberation, representing their reality, as opposed to the usual media image of the native person as victim. Since that groundbreaking exhibition, 
Shelley has repeatedly challenged conventions and expanded our understanding of indigenous identity in Canada. The breadth of Shelley Nero's artistic production is astonishing, including photography, painting, printmaking, drawing, sculpture, installation, film, and video, as well as her contemporary responses to native traditions such as beading. The many exhibitions of her work across Canada, the United States, and Europe, including Greenland, Norway, and Russia, attest to the impact of her representations of native people, their histories and legends. One of the most powerful of these legends is Sky Woman, the origin story of the woman who founded the earth and the human race. Nero narrates her story in every medium, and it filters into her representations of contemporary women's lives, envisioning them in today's world, working and preparing for the future. In Nero's work, woman is a symbol of strength. This is especially vivid in her films. She writes the scripts and directs the films, breaking new ground with her focus on women's lives and the native gay community. Her latest film, currently in final edits and due for release in early 2019, tackles the challenging topic of the long-lasting effects of the residential schools on younger generations. Shelley has been invited to screen her films and speak about them in many venues. Some of these include programs at UCLA in California and Concordia University in Montreal. Her films are regularly featured at festivals such as the Santa Fe Film Festival in New Mexico, where her film, Kissed by Lightning, received the Best Film Award. Another film, Honey Moccasin, was recognized with Best Director and Best Actress at the Dream Speakers Film Festival in Edmonton, Alberta. And the same film received four awards at the Red Earth Film Festival in Oklahoma City. The list of recognition for her films go on, but I will just note that this week, Shelley is invited to another film festival in Richmond, Virginia. Shelley has held numerous residencies and presented at international conferences. A recent example of a conference was on Pocahontas at the University of London in the UK. From the onset of her career, Shelley has been recognized with multiple prestigious awards. And I give just a sense of this here. Beginning in 1990, when she graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design with an honors degree in fine arts, she received three special awards in sculpture, painting, and installation. There followed a crescendo of recognition. In 2012, the Ontario Arts Council established the Aboriginal Arts Award, and Shelley was the first recipient. 2017 was an amazing year. She received the Governor General Award for the Visual Arts, followed by the Natitian Foundation Reveal Award. Finally came the spectacular Scotiabank Photography Award for the top Canadian photographer of the year. This culminated this year in a retrospective exhibition of her photography at the Ryerson Image Centre in Toronto. With a significant book titled Shelley Nero Scotiabank Award, with essays by AGO curator Wanda Nanabush and artist professor Ryan Rice, published by the eminent German house of Steidel. We were very fortunate to work with Shelley here when she was in the Master of Fine Arts program in Visual Arts. Through her thesis work, she taught us about the diaspora of the Mohawk Nation from the Adirondack Mountains and Mohawk Valley and the settlement of the Six Nations Reserve near Brantford and the history and myths of the Iroquois people. Our good fortune continues with the course Shelley is teaching this term in the Sasa program. Please welcome Shelley Nero to speak to us in the present. Photographs and other stuff. Oh. Uh, 
quick. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm going to show photos and I'm going to show a couple of videos and uh, then we'll have a question period. Okay. Um, this is Mohawks and Beehives and it's a series I made after the Oka crisis in the summer of 1990. And the community of Ganesotaki, Quebec outside of Montreal, created an astounding act of resilience in the country of Canada for 78 days. Indian land was protected from developers uh, by Mohawks who lived there, or who lived in that area since early 1700s. With this dispute brought daily reports of native life in general, often detailing substandard ways of living, showcasing the effects of colonialism uh, led me to feel affected by the increased coverage of all that is negative towards na native people. The fall and the summer of 1990 going into the winter of 91 left me feeling sad and in a state of hopelessness. I felt as an artist I could deal with this through art making. I asked my sisters if they were interested in collaborating with me in the series. I wanted a day of fun, a day where we didn't have to think about our political position in this country, a day, a day where we owned the situation we could control. My sisters, Bunny, Beverly and Betts, agreed to wear makeup and go into the city of Brantford to acknowledge Joseph Brandt in front of his statue in Victoria Park. The work itself was hand-colored, 8 by 10 black and white photographs. In the end, the series was a success, and we've managed to find uh, our larger-than-life personas, if only it was for a couple of hours. Great. Uh, this one is called uh, Queen, Queen Bees, and it was mostly just an exercise in hand-coloring. And this is the statue in downtown Brantford, and that's uh, Joseph Brandt on top. And I'll go back to this. So there we are in front of the statue of Joseph Brandt, and um, I made a little series of them standing in front of it. And it's, behind us stands a monument to the late great chief JB. He brought us from upper New York State from the Mohawk Valley, carried in his jeweled bag and blown into the wind. We grew as maples, oaks, and pines along the banks of the Grand. We followed that yellow brick road and clicked our red heels hard. But this is where we'll stay forever and for thee we stand on guard. Uh, in my work I think I take a lot for granted in, as I'm making the work because this work is really referencing Mohawk people having to leave the Mohawk Valley after the American Revolution and uh, we ended up in Brantford. So if anybody knows that area, the Adirondack Valley, uh, the Mohawk Valley, it's so beautiful that I think, how do we end up in Brantford? <laughs> but I can't complain too much, and I won't. Um, and part of that series goes on to this piece, which is called The Iroquois is a Highly Developed Matriarchal Society. And this really is a call for us to pay attention to the women in in our lives and it's like okay this is a sentence I heard all my life repeat it to us uh, you know in classrooms and history class and it's like you know the Iroquois is a highly developed matriarchal society it's like what does that mean I didn't know what it meant at the time and as I got older it's, I start to realize you start breaking it down and you start to understand the language and uh, what it's all about and it's very uh, it's like historical reference. So my question was, if we're so important to the Iroquois society, we should be doing more than we are. <clears throat> this one is portrait of the artist sitting with a killer surrounded by French curves. Um, I'm often asked which one is the killer, and I always say any one of them could have been a killer, but I'm just making light here, and it's the cigarette. And the French curves are the architectural tools that you find, you know, in artists using their work. This piece is called The Rebel, and it's my mother 
I took this photograph in 1982, and it sort of has had a life of its own, and it was recently featured in a, a billboard on Highway 6, just outside of the reserve in the summertime. In her lifetime, in her younger years, she was so carefree, laughing, singing, dancing. She would look out to the horizons and let her thoughts drift out with the never-ending tide. As maturity set in, she would become depressed over the fact that soap operas have no endings. Some country music reminds her of soggy cornflakes and she could never find the matching sock to the one she held in her hand. Native issues would never be resolved in her lifetime. She would give herself a shake and realize Christmas was six months away, the kids would be out of school soon, and Friday was just a day away. And that's the installation shot of that piece. In 1992, I did This Land is Mine Land. And uh, it's a triptych, as you can see, and it's a contemporary um, photograph. It's myself dressed in contemporary clothes, and the middle image is one of my family, and the last one is, is just a plain image of me. And I like to say that um, to get to the number three, you have to have a combination of the first and the second one. The mat is, uh, has hand-carved designs around the photographs and I like to think of them as being like portals or doorways and it's the sort of thing that you have to step through to uh, really see the work. This one is Final Frontier. Judge Me Not. Uh, the middle image in this piece is my sister and we're on Parliament Hill. And it's like a month after Oka had finished, so we went on a bus and we went to Parliament Hill. And I think her sign there says the justice for Native or Aboriginal people. Love Me Tender. Mohawk Worker. And that's an image of my dad. He's about 17 there. Looks like he's got an ax in his hand and he's about to cut some wood. North American Worker, or North American Welcome, sorry. And that's my mom, and she's at a powwow, and she's got the T-shirt the from the powwow on. Santa is a Dede. Survivor. The woman in the middle is my father's grandmother. Warning of Snow and Mineland. Um, so I think the work is pretty straightforward. This is a series of uh, photo collages. I was really interested in the kaleidoscopic image and I wanted to make multiples of the same image and then figure out a way to, design, to create designs of the image, but um, I don't know, I, I ended up just kind of liking the way some of the um, images look mirrored. So this one is not kaleidoscopic, but it's, uh, it's almost kaleidoscopic. And they mostly have numbers. There's no titles. This one has a title, and I think it's called number five. And this one is called uh, Finding Others Like Herself. And this one is also called Finding Others Like Herself, Part B. This one is Flying Woman Meets Earth Man. That's a building in downtown Toronto. Ah, the shirt. I even have a statement here. Oh, I don't. Um, the shirt is, um, was created in 2003. The year before that, I was going on my way to a photo conference and I um, looked out my window and we're flying over Texas and I saw land be 
below me and it was all parceled up and everything had a fence and everything was nice and neat and I started thinking about the Comanches and how they had to really fight to try to retain that land that we're flying over. And as we're flying, um, these words came to me very quickly. And then I got to the conference and I asked my friends who were there if they would mind participating in the um, idea that I had. And they said they would. And I'm very happy they said yes, otherwise I probably would not have done it. So um, my ancestors were annihilated, exterminated, murdered, and massacred. They were lied to, cheated, tricked, and deceived. Attempts were made to assimilate, colonize, enslave, and displace them. And all I get is this shirt. And where's the shirt? And the non-native woman now has the shirt on. And she's saying, and all I get is this shirt. So, it's, you know, it's a um, pretty straightforward series of photographs. And uh, I also made a video from, the, from that time as well. Um, the piece actually showed in uh, Venice Biennale in 2003 as a video. When we were getting ready to show stuff there, we were instructed not to make something that if it disappeared off the walls, that you, know, you wouldn't miss mind it going. So I thought, well, a DVD would be the easiest way for me to show the work. This series is called The Essential Sensuality of Ceremony. And when I was at Western in 97 or 96, I was doing a lot of work on the legend of the peacemaker. And I really wanted to study the story and find out what, what the story was all about. Because again, it's one of those things that you keep hearing about and hearing about. And until I absolutely sit down and start to study it, I really don't know what I'm supposed to be getting out of it. So. Um, the legend of the peacemaker starts, nobody even knows when it happened, but it was happened in um, Iroquois country where people were fighting with each other and uh, going through a state of real dysfunction. They didn't know how to look after each other, but I think it started before that as well. Different um, things I've read have said that disease came through the continent and wiped out uh, a population of 19 million down to 600,000. So the ones that were left really had no social graces. There were no, there were no elders. There was nobody to tell them how to get along and you know, what they should be doing. And so had been prophesied the peacemaker was going to come and, and help them change the way they were living. Um, he did show up. And then part of the story is there was a man who was known to be a cannibal and everybody was afraid of him and uh, you know they said you can't go there because the cannibal will eat you. Anyways, the peacemaker went there and he started showing this man how to live properly and what to eat. So um, that's one of the things in the, uh, the story itself. There was other things like there's always tobacco burning, there's um, songs to be sung, there's uh, I'll go through it. This one is sound. This one is uh, to smell because tobacco is always important in the stories and I think it's the awakening of the senses of smell. Uh, tasting. It's learning how to eat the right things. In this case it was the deer and it seemed like there was a lot of uh, a big population of deer. And touch. And Part of the story is um, wiping, the we wiping away the tears of grief so you can think with a clear mind and go on in your, in your life. And, you know, not, not think about your grief, but learn to live with it. And touch, here's a uh, wampum. The next series is called Ghost Girls and Grandmas. 
Um, sometimes I have really detailed explanations of what the work means and sometimes it, I just made the work without really giving it too much thought because I, I believe that um, not everything has to be explained. I think, you know, as time goes on then you, you'll find that explanation. So this one is a uh, ghost and part of the series is the earth and girls and at the breeze through the trees and grandmas. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to show a video and then I'll come back to my visuals. Miriam, could you help me? <laughs> With my <laughs> and now I'll talk a little bit about the video that we're going to see. It's called Tree. I was asked in 2007 if I was interested in producing um, a five minute film using any, any kind of film I wanted. And uh, I, this opera came to me through Roberto Arriganello. He was the director at Lyft, which is the liaison for Toronto filmmakers. And I said, how can you say no to an opera like that? And I had never used 35 millimeter before. And, and I, to me, this was a huge gift that given, to be given that opportunity. So I had one day, I had, <clears throat> I think we had two rolls of film and a thousand dollars. So,
the next video is I made in 2005. It's uh, from a video called Sweet uh, Indian. And uh, I was really influenced by Kurosawa's dream, so this is just a small section of that video. And uh, I just let it play. Yes, this is Mars Thunderchild. What? Who? Sitting Bull? What? What's going on? You never call me. Well, I'm sorry you think I'm just fooling around with my Indian identity, but right now it's all I've got. enrolled in immersion classes. I take beadwork every Wednesday at the Indian Center. I burn sage at sunrise, if I'm up and I remember. Whoa there, SB. We aren't running from any cavalry here. But, but we are still struggling to hold on to what we have. My parents are really happy for me and what I've accomplished. My grandparents are very proud. I think the day the worst of everything. Maybe there's still racism. They are always thinking of new ways to not acknowledge us, to get rid of us. They suffered. They were beaten like dogs. Ooh, apples. I don't know how they survived. I don't think I would have. Yes, I know we are the future. Yes, I know 
know it's now up to us to keep it together. Indian pageants are for fun. And I know I'm gonna win, so why the grief? After I won last year, I decided to retire. I got my trophies, my banners, and my scholarship. <sighs> I'm old now anyways. I'm studying American history. And it makes me sad and angry. <sighs> and I try not to let it kill me. Every day I walk past young Indian people who've given up and look like ghosts. I try to be kind, but sometimes it's hard. <sighs> no, I don't think I'm better. Just focused. Come on, Sitting Bull, you're my hero. I wish I was like you, but... struggle you suffered, but I know within my heart I will never go through what you had to go through. Hold on, sitting. there's someone at the door. magnificent thing anyone has ever given to me. I can't talk anymore. I'm gonna cry. Yes, Mr. Bo. I know I have the world in my hands.
burn some tobacco. These are collages of arms and uh, There's four of them. This one I called Boundless. This one is called Borders. This one is Treaties. And this one is Unity. And I really wanted to, them to be long and stretched out looking like treat, um, treaty belts. And it was uh, right after a conflict that occurred in Caledonia and um, you know, I just wanted to make a very simple portrayal of uh, how these things sort of are seen and get worked out and uh, what's, what's the important message here. This is La Pieta. I made this in 2007. Um, okay. And it's water. The first and seventh images are of water. I use this to symbolize the importance of an element essential for all living things. Without it, we would die. The earth uses it to cleanse and heal itself after periods of chaos and turmoil. Water carries us for nine months in our mother's womb and makes our journey into this world easier. Water promises a life of abundance, growth, safety, and hope for the future. This infinite view represents what is lost in the diaspora of Iroquois people when they were forced to leave the Mohawk Valley after the American Revolution. The natural beauty never to be returned to takes my breath away. Again, the landscape represents mother, a place always producing, always there, and a place that had to be defended and eventually lost. The, the maternal homeland still waits for the return of her people. This image is a close-up of the resources, a single tree, the trunk, or the detail allows the viewer to see what would otherwise be ignored. We can examine each bark chunk, each shadow and crease. The knots act as invitations for us to listen and comment on the physicality of each tree as an individual. They have character and personality and can be cut down at the will of any man. This series of images are to represent the resources that are lost and damaged in times of war. The grand landscape is torn apart. Over time, the earth will heal itself. The loss of young life leaves a definite scar on the world, no matter whose life, whose side of the battle that was fought. Mothers will cry forever. I return to the landscape, a different type of landscape. This photo was taken in the winter. The leaves and grass are gone. The bare leaves of the tree hang in anticipation of the spring. As a metaphor for sadness, this, for, this forest looks full but is empty at the same time. The bareness waits, never knowing when birds will sing again from its branches. This photo was taken at the edge of Caledonia. <clears throat> it was taken before the protests and land claims filled the front pages of the newspaper in the summer of 2005. These hydro towers look like they're sneaking up out of the landscape. They also represent representative of the power this place holds. But it's not a spiritual power, but one of monetary value, a superficial power putting everyone on hold. Juxtaposed at the Grand River, I find these two connecting elements catapults my imagination back to a time when our traditional ancestors tried to remain in their contemporary world, negotiating with politicians and businessmen. I feel like we have not moved on since that time. And we've turned, we are returning back to the image of water. The frame, I'll talk about the frame around the piece. When I started to think about the series of images, I wanted it to be an abstract slew of pictures, much like visual poetry. I wanted these images to blend together and form not in a literal meaning, but give me emotional sensation. I wondered how I could make the statement representative of war, motherhood, the destruction of the earth, and the destruction of armies trained to move as a unit and ultimately die or succeed. I began by thinking of poppies and how they have become the symbol of past wars. We immediately know what their place is. 
I was going to put a representation of what a poppy might look like in wampum beads. I was also thinking about what Tom Porter had said as he explained a wampum belt he was holding at a gathering many years ago. <clears throat> the belt he held was held up and down, not sideways. There was something that looked like a cross. He said anthropologists say this design was influenced by the church. He said the symbol is confused with the Christian cross, but he went on to explain it is a traditional symbol showing the spirit world and the earth. There was a line representing the earth and a shorter line continuing showing the sky world and the direction your spirit leaves once you pass. Remembering that story, I started to make a wampum belt representing a war and keeping in mind a poppy. I wanted this belt to also have a balance of black and white, good and bad. I'm not educated in the philosophy of war, so I didn't want to comment on it. I do know people are affected by it everywhere and every day. I wanted the red cloth behind the belt to be obvious about representing bloodshed. Together with the beads and the red broadcloth, I wanted to contain the photos to be seen as an Iroquois comment of how we are aware of the outside world and we are affected by the activity outside of outside forces. Uh, this piece is called Parallel Worlds of Women and Macintosh actually owns this work. Um, a few years ago, I was on a road trip with my friend Louise Naguchi. I was traveling through the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee in New York State. We stopped in a few of the small towns, mostly to see what was in the antique stores. We stopped in Segertes, New York, and checked out one of those stores. There came upon a stack of stereoscopes that were taken in the First World War. The one I became immediately attached to was one of the caption, Mademoiselle Summer decorated for heroic actions under fire. The text on the back of the stereoscope tells the story of a young French woman doing what she had to do to keep the Germans at bay. She escaped execution by a firing squad and is now honored in the halls of Sorbonne. I was inspired to make my own stereoscope based on one of the most important women in Iroquois culture. Our stories are not encapsulated or recognized by outside cultures and are often ignored, especially when the main character is a woman. It now becomes our mission to place women in spaces where we can talk about and shed light on their participation and contribution to society. There is a link between the two images, and that link is a two-row image that has been abstracted. It looks more like a clam than a wampum belt. I wanted to create a, a feeling of time traveling and become aware of that journey. And this is the third image in that triptych. This is uh, a female character from the story of the Peacemaker, and it's Jigonsase. And in the story of Jigonsase, she is um, also known as the mother of the mother of uh, nations. She was the first woman to recognize uh, the peacemaker and Tadadaho is and Hiawatha as being characters that are going to lead um, the nations into positions of peace and forming a, a society. And so that one looks. Um, I get too carried away when I'm making my work. Sometimes I think, you know, I get too involved in images of war, not necessarily of war images, but I think about war a lot and how it has effect on everybody. And I think it affects everybody in this room in some way or another. And then I also try to think of making work that, you know, goes the other way. So I kind of try to pull myself away from thinking of those uh, very serious uh, conditions and then I try to create something that is a little bit more lighthearted. This one is called uh, Sleeping Warrior Dreams of Hunting. I had another title but it was too long to use with the, uh, with the work. And I, I think it was called um, The Gaze of the Native North American Male as He Lounges on His Post-Colonial Sofa. But I thought, no, I don't use that. <laughs> Um, so I just went sleeping warrior dreams of hunting. This is a young man from the reserve and he, he really enjoyed being a model. 
This when a sleeping warrior dreams of life in the sky. Sleeping warrior dreams of fighting no more. Sleeping warrior dreams of pastures and power. Dressing sleeping warrior. And four directions of, of sleeping warrior. Um, I'm going to continue with no written notes. This next series is called M Stories of Women. And it uh, really came about thinking about the murdered and the missing. And that's another uh, subject that sometimes really, you know, I, I, I have to do something for myself to, um, as an artist, like how can I, how can I resolve these issues? And, um, you know, personally I can't. As an artist, I can try to resolve some of them. So this one is called Ancestor. And I was really thinking about um, images of Native women. For years, images of Native women were not present because uh, it was only a certain kind of image that was acceptable. You know, you had to be young, you had to be beautiful, you had to fit that stereotype of what Native women should look like. And I've been trying to, mostly by using my family, my sisters, my mother, and just saying, you know, we're just, we're just a very ordinary bunch of people. Except my daughter, she's very beautiful. This is my daughter, and this is uh, ancestor. Oh, let's see, ordinary, that's me. <laughs> uh, this one I call bagging it. And um, it's a reminder of my, to myself about how things are handled. And sometimes they're handled very insensitively. This one is, uh, I made this after a, a community in Northern Ontario asked the government to send the flu virus to them because they were afraid they were going to get the flu virus. And instead of them send, having the flu virus sent to them, they had 200 body bags sent to them instead. So the pieces that are in the background, it's, you know, just to remind, like they do things like that now. And uh, I just think it's very bad medicine for them to do that. Um, this one is called Beginnings and DNA, birds. Um, it's a slight take on the Sky Woman story. This is my friend, she lives in Winnipeg and we're, the strip on the bottom is the strip from the Hudson Bay blanket and she is on top of the uh, sacred, four, the four sacred colors. And finding her helpers, it's again referencing uh, Sky Woman. And the birds are flying up to help her down as she sees the water below. Land of Opportunity. This is uh, a niece of mine standing in front of the Tudela Heights in Brantford. Legacy. And part of the story of Sky Woman is she went to help her dying husband who uh, asked her to get him a, a drink of water from the Tree of Life, which she tried to, but she ended up falling through the hole in the sky. Uh, there's my friend Laurie Blondeau. She's uh, Blackfoot Cree and uh, she has four children. There's four little buffaloes underneath her. Uh, memories of flight. And I, I think about the Sky Woman story quite a bit and how we came from that sky and how just the ability to have an imagination to think, you know, of the sky world and having that story made centuries ago, it just really uplifts me and it makes me kind of happy to know that, you know, somebody had the ability to keep a story, tell a story that still feeds my imagination. There's uh, my other friend from Attawapiskat and the canoe and beadwork and everything else that her community is quite capable, capable of, but you know, sometimes stories coming out of Attawapiskat aren't the nicest or not, aren't the happiest.
This I took a picture of uh, just outside of Fergus. And if anybody knows Six Nations history, after the war, after the American Revolution, we were granted land, we were granted um, six miles on both sides of the Grand River from the source to the mouth. And, you know, we don't have that now. But driving through Fergus one day, I saw this sign that says, uh, save thousands in, th in Fergus. So it's, to me, it's like um, colonization again. Only thing, you know, if you, if you want to have a, a house, move to Fergus and you'll get a cheap house. The Grand River, this was taken outside of Caledonia. And I just, I just thought the play of the, the sign Grand River with the power, um, towers in the background with the river itself, it was really like poetry in motion. So I went, and I, I went home, got my camera, took a picture. And the wampum that's around the frame, or excess frame, is uh, the two-row wampum. This one I call Giver of Bread and Cheese. Um, after we moved from New York Valley, or Mohawk Valley, uh, this story doesn't quite make sense to me, but Queen Victoria, on her birthday, said, give them bread and cheese. So. For years and years on her birthday, we always stood in line to get this hunk of bread and cheese. And, uh, and then at some point, you know, she passed away. So the government kept giving us bread and cheese on her birthday, and then they stopped giving us bread and cheese. And then the council started giving us bread and cheese. And then I think, that's a crazy tradition. But um, so I kind of looked at it in a really critical way for a long time, but now I think it's important that we still pay attention to those things that keep our history kind of, you know, living. Otherwise, if, if we weren't getting bread and cheese, we would forget a lot of that little bit, little bit of history. The moon and me and a celestial tree. Uh, the, colon, the wild ones and the colonized. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, that came out pretty good. And passing through, this was done in 1994. It's a combination of oil paints and photography. And the, each panel is four by six feet. And so it has my mother coming into the city and uh, you know she's welcome to the city. And as she gets there, she's confronted by all these cement buildings, and then the last one is, thank you, and come again. But I like to think that, you know, once upon a time before the city was there, we had all this landscape that grew naturally, was beautiful, and, you know, I like to think of those things. And, but above all, the sky will always be with us. Um, this one I call War. It's, again, in reference to the other piece, La Pieta, maybe a more condensed version. Uh, nature's Scream, photograph of a tree trunk I found when I w was walking. And I took, a f took this photograph, and I wanted to go back and take more pictures of it, but when I went back, I couldn't find that tree, so I don't know. Abnormally Aboriginal, I think I have a, no, I don't. Um, it's really about how we label ourselves. And it's like, one year it's Aboriginal, one year it's Indigenous, one year it's Indian, sometimes it's First Nations. Um, you know, so it's like always in a quandary of how you're going to be represented and what that representation means. Um, people that I, where I come from don't like the term Aboriginal and I don't like it either. I think it's too easy. It's almost like a scientific uh, experiment. And let's see what happens now. So there's normal, original. This piece is called Solace, and it's uh, six photographs. And I just wanted to create this installation of solace of landscapes. and. You know, you can only absorb TV so long, you can only look at newspapers so much, you can only listen to the radio because after a while it does have an effect. And I wanted to create a, 
an environment where you really didn't have to think about those things, even for um, temporarily. Um, this piece is called the show off and I've had these little plastic guys around for years and I, last year I wanted to do something with them so I just uh, took some photos and pho photoshopped them this one is called the dimpled one Uh, day at the beach. Then everyone got mad. Mr. Ambidextrous. These are fossils I found on a rock face on Lake Erie and I just, you know, I'm like those kids that love fossils and dinosaurs. Well, here's, here's my love, fossils. I just took a whole bunch of these photographs. And then I made a, an installation for them and I called it Ghost Wall. And I do work with American Indian nickels. And so here I have the nickel and I have the fossil. And um, it's inserted on top of a landscape. And this series, there's four in this series. I called it History of the World. And I think that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Maggie and Miriam, and then we'll have a little bit more time for questions before we wrap up and have a brief reception in the rooms next door. OK, I just want to start by thanking you, Shelley, for coming here to speak with us today. Um, so my question is, um, over this year's speaker series, focusing on the theme of humanizing the future, we've talked about the inevitable and profitable interaction between sciences and arts. We've ta discussed the topics of the future of creativity in a technologically advanced world, as well as the detrimental effects of overuse of technological advancements without ethical precaution in the case of the use of antibiotics. My question here uh, deals more with a social question. It seems impossible to humanize the future, as our speaker series suggests, when our nation has so much to do to repair the damage it has done and still inflicts on indigenous peoples of this land. In your opinion, what would be the major steps that our country needs to uh, take to engage in meaningful reparations with indigenous peoples? Um, well, being an artist, I think it really comes down to looking at art and reading what writers are writing. Uh, what filmmakers are doing and it's uh, because they're I think people there's a lot of people who are extending themselves trying to um, have their story told and I think once the stories are told and people listen and watch and read I think it you know it'll bridge that gap that is uh, there um, it really comes down to like funding and it comes down to governments saying we have to we have to make these funds available to people so that they can provide that you know that layer of of uh, indigenous life that we aren't um, prone to see. So it's really about you know just making that available to many people. Thanks so much, Shelley. Um... So I'm going to start with the kind of ramble about another film, but I promise I'll get back to your work. So when the film Get Out first came out, it raised a lot of controversy about its use of comedy in terms of making its political commentary on race. 
So for example, there was a lot of stories I saw shared on social media by black people who watched the film in theaters full of white people who would laugh at the wrong times. Or there was also the controversy about how the film was categorized as a comedy by a lot of major award during the awards season. And that seemed like critics were kind of dismissing the real horrors of racism that were depicted in the film. So decades before Get Out came out, you've been using comedy in your film, or humor in your films, while also putting forward a really strong political message. So can you speak broadly about the relationship between humor and politics in your work? Um, and some more specific questions maybe are about how does humor in your work register differently for different audiences? So for example, for indigenous people or non-indigenous people, um, and have you noticed that the humorous elements of your older works, for example, Honey Moccasin, are, resonate differently with audiences today than they did perhaps when the film first came out in the 90s? It resonates differently from me. <laughs> I look at it now and I think, whoa. Um, I think humor is uh, it's an element of health and healing. And if you can find that humor in, in whatever you're trying to do, I think it's... Um, you know, it's a step forward to, uh, to getting healthy. Um, I also think, too, that indigenous communities lost their, a lot of their languages. And because of the, the loss of language, I think they lost a good chunk of that soci socialization. And I think humor is uh, part of it. I don't speak Mohawk, and I will never speak Mohawk because I don't have the advantage of being in a community that, you know, talks, speaks Mohawk. But I think that um, humor is one of those, one of those um, elements in society that will bring people together and, it'll, you know, immediately you will become attached to the person sitting beside you if they're laughing at the same thing you are. Um, I showed Honey Moccasin in a Navajo College in Arizona, and I think there were like 400 students in that theater, and they laughed so hard. You know, I thought, well, this, I want to come back here every time to show a film because they really enjoyed. And I think it's just the fact that they saw themselves represented on screen. You know, at that time there wasn't too much representation, so it was um, it was like a joy for them to recognize the people that they were watching. And part of that joy comes out through laughter. Uh, Kiss by Lightning got shown at the Imaginative Film Festival a couple years ago. No, not a couple years ago, more like eight years ago. And again, the audience responded with so much laughter, even in the serious parts. You know, it's like, no, don't laugh there. And, but to me, it just um, reconfirms that laughter is so important and it's, uh, you know, and if, and if you can construct something so that a theater will laugh, it's really a, a gift to me as well. You know, so I, I just think uh, humor is very, um, it's a healthy thing to do. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, I wonder, are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question, Shelley. Um, it's been a real privilege to have you here, um, and you're not finished yet, um, teaching uh, in our program. And I was thinking about education, um, and I wondered if you have any thoughts about what you see as needed in the wider education system regarding indigenous people and our understanding of what reconciliation might mean. And also if you have thoughts about what's needed more specifically for indigenous students and are those things the same? Well, I think uh, for indigenous students and in indigenous communities, again, it comes down to funding, making sure that there's enough teachers that are getting the enough material, um, and it's really paying attention to what they're being taught. Um, I don't know any, well, I know Elizabeth, who was here a couple of weeks ago. Um, but as far as teachers go, I really don't know any teachers there. But 
I just think that the emphasis has to be on education, you know, and the politicians are so ready to yank that education funding away. And, and for here, I don't know, Patrick, it's like, this could be a never-ending stream of, uh, of people just, you know, doing stuff and, and, and bringing it out and showing you what, you know, what they're thinking about. Thank you. Pauline, I think we want to use the microphone for the sake of the video. Thank you so much for your talk, Shelley. I had a question about the role of collaboration in your work. Um, when we were watching Mars Thunderchild, I recognized a song by Elizabeth Hill that she sang when she was here a couple of weeks ago. And um, I noticed how uh, you often used family members and artist friends in your photography. And I was wondering if you could talk about the role of collaboration in the creation of your art um, and thoughts on that process. I really like using friends and family. It makes the work so much richer for myself when I'm uh, developing it. Um, when I used to work in a dark room, because I worked a lot of hours in the dark room, I felt that by having their faces in front of me developing it, it just really kind of kept them closer to myself. And I just felt, you know, pretty good about being in the dark room as opposed to being in the dark room and developing other things. But um, just, ha just having that community, like having Elizabeth working on music, she's worked on quite a bit of my music and she's working on the soundtrack for the film I'm working on now. It just makes it, um, I don't know, you know, we can always talk about the work. We can always project into the future, well, we're going to work on this next time. It just makes it so much more uh, enjoyable. I also want to thank you for your um, very interesting talk. I was struck by um, your observation that you're, you think a lot about war. And was I wrong in that? Um, and so, but the way in which you visualize war is not in the conventional kind of sense of, you know, photojournalism and explosions and spectacles and the obvious forms of violence. So um, I'll, I'll get to the question. Um, in your series on the sleeping warriors, I kept thinking of Tim Hetherington's work on sleeping soldiers. Um, which depicts soldiers at rest and, and, and repose. And people who, critics who look at that series think about that as an attempt to humanize these men who are about to go off to war, to fight. Um, but then their critique is basically that this is the moment of rest that would enable them to do the work of war. But it seems to me that what you're doing with Sleeping Warriors is, is playful, but it's trying to do something else. So can you maybe speak a little bit about what distinction you see between a sleeping soldier or a soldier in that kind of conventional warfare and Sleeping Warriors? Um, yeah, like my father was in the war and just, you know, we had Remembrance Day a couple days ago and, you know, as a kid we were always taken to those Remembrance Day services and then to the um, Legion afterwards and it was like for us it was really boring because you know we had to sit through the roll calls of all the names of the men that um, didn't come back after the war and it was just like so it was just boring but as I as I started getting older um, those memories really stuck with me you know here we were all dressed up, waiting for the ceremony to go through, and um, I don't know, it just kind of uh, became a part of my mental state. So now when I think about those, you know, it's, it's, it's very emotional. It wasn't emotional then, but now it's like, you know, I'm getting old. <laughs> and, and those uh, Remembrance Day services you see on TV, they really... Um, 
because, you know, the soldiers' population, I don't know how many there are now, but there's only like a handful left. The Sleeping Warrior, um, it was really a, a thought process of looking at a warrior and, you know, just trying to put him in a position of being at peace. And um, the one photo that, would, that I did show, where, which was uh, Sleeping Warrior, Dreams of Fighting No More, well, the, um, the guy that I had modeling for me said that peace affected him a lot. And he, at the time, he said he was going to stop drinking and doing whatever he was doing. But I just thought, wow, that's pretty powerful to know that an image would have an effect on somebody who's, you know, participating in the photograph. Um, yeah, but I, I tried not to. I promised myself I, you know, I won't think about war so much. But I know I will. Yeah. Have you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, have you given any thought to an art artistic uh, uh, statement on uh, Donald Trump? A statement on Donald Trump? <laughs> uh, I would spend all day talking about Donald Trump. No, I have nothing to say about Donald Trump that we all know he's not a good guy. Yeah. I think this is probably a, a good point to wrap things up and I want to thank you Shelley for the tremendous generosity and the hope that your work gives us while also being so honest and also imaginative and inventive and expansive. And you've brought that kind of generosity here to Western while you've been teaching. Um, Maggie has a present for you and it's purple. <laughs> And with that, we thank you, Shelley, and I ask you to help me thank Shelley. Uh, thank you.